the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III, an ancient discovery that proves the truth of the Bible. Ancient yet timeless, a monument that stands tall, revealing connections that might just surprise you. What is this obelisk? And how does it completely prove the truth of the Bible? Watch this video till the end to find out. The Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III is a stone monument that was built in 825 BC to celebrate the 31 years of successful military campaigns by King Shalmaneser III and his chief minister. It was erected in the courtyard of a central building located in Kalu. It is yet another proof of the authenticity and truth of the Holy Scripture. The Black Obelisk is basically a black Neo-Andrian stone sculpture from a long time ago, approximately around 858 to 824 BC. Let's see what Neo-Assyrian sculptures are. Assyrian sculptures are centered around Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. The empire extended its rule over Mesopotamia, the Levant, Egypt, parts of Anatolia, Arabia, and modern-day Iran and Armenia. Unlike earlier Mesopotamian art, the Syrian sculpture shows an increased use of stone for large sculptures. Many of these artworks are now in European or American museums, due to extensive excavations from 1842 to 1855. The palace reliefs showcase the king engaged in war, hunting, and various royal duties. Unfortunately, some works were deliberately destroyed. The black obelisk is made of limestone, and pictures and words are carved into it. This ancient piece comes from a place called Nimrud. So, the obelisk is like a big, tall stone with scenes and words carved into it all about the achievements of King Shalmaneser III. It was found by an archaeologist named Sir Austin Henry Layard in 1846, and there are copies of it in a few other museums as well. The central figure of this obelisk, Shalmaneser III, ruled the Neo-Assyrian Empire from 859 BC until his death in 824 BC. His reign, was marked by continuous military campaigns against various regions, including eastern tribes, Babylonians, and nations of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Urartu. These campaigns reached as far as Lake Van and the Taurus Mountains. We see him cross paths with a king in the Bible, Jehu of Israel, arguably the most significant event recorded on the Black Obelisk. Jehu is widely known as the man that destroyed Jezebel and her family. The black obelisk names Jehu, son of Omri. He was the 10th king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and he played a significant role in biblical history. He was the son of Jehoshaphat and the grandson of Nimshai. Jehu was anointed as king by prophet Elisha, he was on a mission to destroy the family of Jezebel. Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, who ruled the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal at the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. So Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 29 through 33. Her name in Phoenician meant primrose, but the same name in Hebrew, Jezebel, meant garbage, and this was how she was known. It was clear that she used Ahab to achieve her own evil ends, and that he needed a little persuading. 
This was the first time that a king of Israel had allied himself by marriage with a heathen princess. The Rule of Jezebel Jezebel persuaded Ahab to accept Baal, a nature god, after they married. As a woman desiring greater power, she wanted to eliminate those who dared to question her, and she had most of Yahweh's prophets slain at her request. She is the first and most powerful agitator of persecution against God's saints. She spared no pains to keep idolatry in all its glory around her, guided by no principle, controlled by no fear of either God or man, and fervent in her allegiance to her heathen worship. 450 prophets ministered under her care to Baal, besides 400 prophets of the groves or Asherah, or Astarte, a Phoenician goddess which ate at her table. Jezebel is thrown over and overthrown. Ahab perished in a battle with the Syrians a few years later, and Jezebel reigned for nearly another 10 years. Elisha the prophet continued Elijah's mission to eradicate Baal worship. He installed a militant commander named Jehu to be king of Israel, an order that prompted civil war. Now Elisha the prophet summoned one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get ready and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, then look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshah, and go in and have him get up from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, this is what the Lord says, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not wait. So the young man the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, behold, the commanders of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, commander. And Jehu said, For which one of us? And he said, For you, commander. He then got up and went into the house, and the prophet's servant poured the oil on his head and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the entire house of Ahab shall perish, and I will eliminate from Ahab every male person both slave and free in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dogs will eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Now Jehu went out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, is everything well? Why did this crazy fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know very well the man and his talk. Jehu then slew Jehoram and plotted to depose Jezebel and take his position as Israel's king. She suited herself in nice dresses for the occasion, anticipating his arrival. She mocked him from her window and Jehu ordered her eunuchs to toss her out of the window. He ordered that she be buried as a king's daughter after her fall and death. But it was discovered that dogs had devoured the majority of her body, just as Elijah had predicted. Jezebel has become known as a model of a wicked lady, exemplifying the traits of cruelty, greed, and vanity. 2 Kings chapter 9 verses 30 through 36. Yet despite his brutal rise to power and tolerance for idol worship, 
Jehu's reign is marked by divine approval in the Bible. Yahweh rewards him, allowing four generations of kings from his lineage to rule Israel. Now here's where it gets interesting. The black obelisk of Shalmaneser III shows Jehu in a portrayal that stands as the only known image of an Israelite or Judean monarch in ancient Near Eastern art. The black obelisk of Shalmaneser is a big ancient monument about seven feet tall and two feet wide. It has carvings on all four sides. These carvings show different kings from different places coming to give gifts to King Shalmaneser III of Assyria. Each side of the obelisk has five pictures or panels that show these kings paying respect to Shalmaneser. This shows us that Shalmaneser III was a very powerful king who had control over many areas. The obelisk not only looks impressive, but also tells us stories about how things were back then, like a history book carved in stone. The second picture from the top on the obelisk shows King Jehu from Israel kneeling before King Shalmaneser of Assyria. This King Jehu is the same one talked about in the Bible, and this picture is the only one we have of any Hebrew king from long ago. In the carving, Shalmaneser is doing a special drink offering to his god. There are writings in ancient script called cuneiform all around this picture that tell us what Jehu gave to Shalmaneser. Things like silver, gold, and other valuable items. The text around the panel reads, The tribute of Jehu, son of Amri. I received from him silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase with pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and spears. Examining the Jehu Panel The carving shows King Jehu giving gifts to King Shalmaneser III as a sign of respect. In the picture, King Jehu is on the ground in front of the Assyrian king, showing that he is less powerful. Shalmaneser is performing a ritual where he pours out a drink as an offering to his god. Behind King Shalmaneser III, there are two officials. One is holding a parasol, which is like a fancy umbrella for royalty, and the other is holding a club. Facing the king, two servants are ready to help. One is using a fan and a censer, a container for burning incense, to keep the king cool and the air smelling good. The other servant who has a scepter, a royal staff under his arm, is standing with his hands politely joined together in front of him. In the carving, there's a bearded officer with someone helping him, leading a line of 13 Israelite people. They are bringing valuable presents to the king of Assyria. All these Israelite men have beards and wear peaked caps and bandeaux. They're dressed in long robes that have fringes at the bottom and a belt plus a long scarf with fringes on one end, draped over one shoulder, and they're wearing shoes that come to a point. King Shalmaneser is shown standing under the parasol, taking gifts from Ayua of the House of Humri in 841 BC. Above them, symbols of the Assyrian god's Aser, which is a winged sun disk, and Ishtar, represented by a star, can be seen in the sky. Another fragment mentions Jehu. Jehu is also mentioned on another fragment from the annals of Shalmaneser III that was discovered, which says, Then I took tribute of the Tyrians, of the Sidonians, and of Jehu, of the house of Amri. The second register from the top includes the earliest surviving picture of an Israelite, the Biblical Jehu. Continuing down the monument, 
An unnamed ruler of Masrai takes center stage, their identity lost to time. Marduk Apel Usur of Suhi follows, engaging in actions that convey the dynamics of the politics during that era. And lastly, Kal Purunda of Patton concludes the series. Each scene occupies four panels around the monument, accompanied by cuneiform inscriptions describing the events that led to this scene. What is the significance of Assyria in the Bible? Answer. Assyria was a big deal a long time ago, from about 1700 to 727 BC. It was a super powerful country. Assyria wasn't just any country. It was a huge problem for Israel. God even used the Assyrians to teach the northern kingdom of Israel a lesson. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, is a famous city in its history. That's the city where God sent Jonah with a warning that it was going to be destroyed. Around 740 BC, Assyria started to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, starting with King Pol's rule. 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 26 tells us that God made Pol and Tiglath-Pileser, kings of Assyria, capture and take away the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. They were moved to places like Hala, Habor, Hera, and the river Gozan, and they stayed there. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pol, king of Assyria, the spirit of tiglath pileser king of Assyria, and he carried them away into exile, namely the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and brought them to Hela, Habor, Hera, and to the river of Gozan to this day. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26. About 20 years after that, around 722 BC, the Assyrians, led by Shalmaneser V, captured Samaria, the capital city. At first, Samaria had to pay money to Assyria to avoid being attacked. But when Samaria stopped paying, Shalmaneser V attacked and surrounded the city for three years. Then, 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 5 through 6 tells us that the king of Assyria took the people of Samaria and placed them in Hala by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria. And he settled them in Hala and in Habor, by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 5 through 6. Because Israel kept worshiping idols instead of just God, he allowed the Assyrians to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. Hosea chapter 11 verse 5 predicted that God would use Assyria, which was not strong at the time, to punish the northern kingdom of Israel like a powerful giant. The Bible explains that God did this because the people of Israel didn't listen to him and didn't worship only him. Therefore it will be, that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 12. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, they would neither listen nor do it. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 12. After Israel's northern kingdom fell, some Assyrians moved to Samaria. Ezra chapter 4, verse 2, talks about these people who were sent there by Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria. They said they worshipped the Lord, but they actually mixed their worship of Yahweh with other gods. 
They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God just as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Ezra chapter 4 verse 2 These Assyrians who married people from different backgrounds made it hard for the Israelites to rebuild their temple. They didn't just make things difficult, they actually tried to stop the temple from being rebuilt. According to the pulpit commentary, these Assyrians' descendants later became known as the Samaritan people. After Samaria was attacked, the southern kingdom of Judah was also in danger because of Assyria. When King Hezekiah was in charge of Judah, the Assyrian king named Sennacherib came to fight. First, the Assyrians took over 46 strong cities in Judah. Then they surrounded Jerusalem, the capital city. Sennacherib was very confident. He said that not even the Lord God could stop him from taking over Jerusalem. King Hezekiah tried to make peace by giving Sennacherib a lot of gold and silver, hoping that would make the Assyrian king leave them alone. Through Isaiah, God told Hezekiah that the Assyrians wouldn't be able to enter Jerusalem. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He will not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor will he come before it with a shield, nor throw up a siege rampart against it. Isaiah chapter 37 verse 33 God also had a message for Sennacherib, asking him who he thought he was to disrespect and talk against the Holy One of Israel. Whom have you taunted and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted up your eyes? Against the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah chapter 37 verse 23. Then God sent an angel, and that angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers while they were sleeping. Because of this, Sennacherib stopped trying to take over Judah. Jerusalem was saved because God stepped in to protect it. Unlike the false gods the Assyrians believed in, the Lord proved He was the only real God. The bad things the Assyrians did eventually led to their downfall, and they were judged just like the Bible said they would be. Their country was destroyed. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my wrath to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in his heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. For it says, Are not my princes all kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish, or Hamath like Arpad, or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, will I not do to Jerusalem and her idols what I have done to Samaria and her images? So when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, By the strength of my hand and by my wisdom I have done this, for I have understanding. And I have removed the boundaries of the peoples and have plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man I have brought down their inhabitants, and my hand has found like a nest the wealth of the peoples. And as one gathers eggs that have been abandoned, so I have gathered all the earth. 
and there was not one that moved its wing or opened its mouth or chirped. Is the ax to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors, and under his glory a fire will be kindled like a burning flame, and the light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and he will destroy the glory of his forest and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child could write them down. Isaiah chapter 10 verses 5 through 19. Your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria. Your nobles are lying down in death. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and there is no one to gather them. There is no relief and healing for your hurt. Your wound is incurable. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over what has happened to you. For on whom has your unceasing evil not come continually? Nahum chapter 3 verses 18 through 19. The remnant of Israel will not do wrong nor speak lies nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble and feel afraid. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 13. A prophet described Assyria's end like a big tree being chopped down. Its branches were scattered everywhere, and no one was left to enjoy its shade. Birds and animals made their homes in its fallen branches. Assyria was important in the Bible because they were enemies of Israel, and God used them to teach Israel a lesson for not being faithful. God also showed he was more powerful than any other gods through what happened to Assyria. Isaiah chapter 19 talks about what will happen in the Middle East when Jesus rules for a thousand years. The phrase, in that day, keeps coming up in Isaiah chapter 19, and it means the time when God will fix everything. The prophecy says, Assyria, which is where Iraq is now, Egypt and Israel will all work together to worship the Lord. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third party of Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. Isaiah chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. Egypt, Israel, and Assyria will not only get along, but will also be a good example for other countries. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will make it possible for these countries that used to be enemies to live in peace. Thanks to Jesus, Assyria's future looks good. And that wraps up our exploration of the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Who knew a monument could tell us so much about the past? However, this is not the only artifact that proves the truth of the Bible. To watch another, click here.